What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. I'm Mariana. And I'm Tony. And the fitness industry right now kind of sucks. It's become something built on unrealistic expectations, aesthetics, and external validation directing attention away from what actually matters. The bottom line is we're not trying to provide just another fitness podcast, but completely change the fitness industry for the better by giving you the knowledge and tools so you have confidence in applying the best hustle, training, and nutrition into your own lives. Where today we are talking about the science of overeating and binge eating because at the end of the day, only one thing really gets in the way of either losing weight or not gaining weight over time. And that's overeating. So we put together 10 evidence-based tips to prevent that from happening. And before we get into it, if you want to support us, the best way you can do so is by giving us a five-star rating wherever you are listening. You can also go ahead and follow us on Spotify so you stay up to date on every new episode we drop on Monday. And if you want more after each episode, join us over on Premium for just five bucks a month where you get bonus episodes every single Friday where we're answering your questions. Complete 12-week training programs like our high-frequency full body, ultimate push-pull leg, or our newest two programs dropping next week. You also get other sick perks like weekly Legion supplement giveaways, exclusive discounts to companies like Aura Ring, high-end blood work with Merrick Health, and so much more. Again, that's five bucks a month for all that. Sign up for that is in the show notes down below. And a quick shout out to the sponsor of today's video, who is the same sponsor of all hundred plus episodes of FS Pod. That's Legion Athletics from day freaking one. And we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about them because we have and always will and can continue to do so because they're it. They're it. 100% of their supplements are backed by Scientific Review Board. They're all third-party tested. They even have a no-questions-asked money-back guarantee. So if you try something you like, it doesn't fit well with you, it doesn't do its job or intended job, you just say, hey, it didn't work. Can I have my money back? They say, sure, here you go. Go buy something nice. You can use the <laughs> Legion link in the show notes down below or type in code FSPOD. That's FSPOD at checkout for 20% off your first order or double points on every order after that are you getting deja vu right now i am getting deja vu, uh, deja vu? it's hidden under my big smile this Ooh. is our second time taking a crack at this episode if you guys didn't know tony and i were filming well i guess it's going to be two weeks ago by the time mm. you guys are listening we were taking a trip in la we were filming for our premium subscribers you probably know that because we t- had to take the week off from our ama we we're mm. filming in person had our yearly trip out there, filmed eight great episodes, and we had an issue with the audio, so we can't use any of them. Yeah. But we well, are you guys are not losing out on the content. We're redoing it. It's unfortunate, but we, you guys, we will get together in person this year yeah. again, and it yeah. will be executed. It was a fun time. Yeah, but Mariana flew all the way out here. I drove up to LA from San Diego, and we had the, just the beautiful studio we did last time with Aloe. Great time, but there's an encoding issue on the back end that we didn't catch until we got all the way home. So that was a bite that's on. Monday was tough. <laughs> Not going to yeah. lie with y'all. Monday it's was tough. Just, it's the universe testing us uh, and our resilience, and you just got to keep moving forward. Tony and I, we have to pull ourselves together because we draw these analogies all the time with how like on your fitness or weight loss journey, life gets in the way. Shit sets you back. Sometimes it's inconvenient. Same thing with life. So we got to practice what we preach. You just got to keep, it's how you adapt to it. It's like how you take it and move forward. But still, I had my 24 hours of, and being I mean, pissed. <laughs> one thing about us, we're, we thug it out. We thug it out. Yeah. We've thugged it out before. We thug it out again. Mm-hmm. That's what we do. <laughs> now to the good stuff. Not yes. an understatement. One thing. The one thing that gets in the way of people successfully losing weight or keeping it off is overeating. Mm-hmm. It's just overeating. Sure. At some point or another, giving into hunger. Right. So really what we did today is we're breaking down in the science, these 10 evidence-based tips that all kind of revolve around one simple concept. And that's turning your body's signal to eat more food off or to at least get it under check. And these are things in your lifestyle, in your diet, in your day to day. So they're from a lot of different areas, but they're all really intended to do that one thing. All really supposed to nail that down. I like to think of it as just like taking back control of your hunger and fullness cues yeah. because it, you can't ever, like you don't ever want to fully turn them off, but it's really this lack of control around them. And also I think lack of attention to them oftentimes in life, we turn off our normal 
cues that we get from our body or we are listening to, to things outside of our actual hormones telling us we need to eat and are paying attention to maybe outside stimuli, but really taking back that control of our hunger and fullness, harnessing it and setting yeah. you up for success. Because even if you're not trying to lose weight or lose fat, it's like over your lifetime, if your hunger is not on your side, it's going to, it's what ultimately leads to pe people putting on, you know, 10, 20 pounds over the course of years. It might not be right away, yeah. but just what leads to this snowball that becomes so, so hard to reverse. So that's yeah. what we're talking about today. We got 10 hot tips. I know what all of yeah. them are because we've been here. <laughs> but let's go down this list. Number one, what do you got? This is always being prepared. So having a plan, it sounds really simple, but it applies to anything. If you go into something blind, you're way less likely to be successful at it or be able to execute whatever your goal is without some sort of backup plan when life gets in the way. Like being prepared, having a plan, this really helps you stay on top of hunger because sometimes life gets in the way, we get busy and we don't want to make decisions solely based off of being way too hungry or having just acting on our cravings or what we want right in that moment. Having a plan, some sort of idea of what you're going to eat throughout the week is going to be so huge. This can come from meal prep. It can be as simple as just, you know, I don't want to meal prep every single meal, but I'm going to sit down on Sunday before I go to the grocery store and I'm going to write out what I'm going to have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It could be all the same meals. It really doesn't matter. Getting all those ingredients. So you have some idea going into each day. You're not going into the day blind. You have your goals, you know how much protein you're trying to eat, you know how many calories you're trying to consume, and you're going to plan your meals around that. Of course, this isn't always going to be perfect. So being prepared involves also having some sort of backup plan. So maybe yeah. we're out traveling. That's like the and biggest have, part. Yeah. Yeah. We want to have some high protein snacks on hand or we're going out to dinner and we can, we look at the menu first just to see what some of our options are. We know that this week I might not, you might not have as much time to cook. So I'm going to meal prep a few meals, but maybe I'm going to plan out having Chipotle one night because I know that I can go I like on that. and see how many, see how much protein I can put in a meal and calories. And it's just going to make my life a little bit easier versus letting the day get away from me, getting really hungry, and then just acting instantly on whatever it is I'm craving um, yeah. because the hunger doesn't plan, wait. The backup plan, I think, is the biggest piece of this. Like Mike Tyson, everyone's got a plan until they got punched in the face. That's the most mm -hmm. real thing you could always put it. I even was telling you this story before, before we had left for that. Trip, it sometimes comes down to the simplest, dumbest things where like simple stuff, I falter at too, of just not having yeah. a backup plan in place screws me up. It screws Mariana up. I was telling her for the last several months, I usually pick like a favorite dinner that I'm like, oh, high protein, low cal, fills me up, taste bomb. And I get obsessed with it for like six months and then never touch it again. The last few months meal. I've been, exactly. The last few months I've been doing turkey tacos using like the 99% lean turkey, get some tacos, my shells, my cheese, my lettuce, put everything in there. And I was telling you this at the end of a super, super long day, my brain's a little bit fried. It's easy because I have all the pieces in place. The last day before we came, this sounds so stupid. I usually have five taco shells to fit half a pound of turkey in. Two of the shells broke. I only had three left. I didn't have a backup pack. I had three taco shells and I was sitting there. I'm like, I can't eat my tacos and three shells. So what's the point of doing this whole dinner. And I ended up just getting Uber Eats, this chicken yeah. sandwich place down the road, because I'm like, you know what? Screw it. This is all I ever wanted. It's gone. I didn't have a backup plan in place. And at the end of the day, your, your inhibitions are lowered at the end of the day from work, from stress, from whatever. So if something gets in your way to prevent even a small little hurdle, one or two of those is all it takes to knock you off and fall off the wagon. And as stupid as that sounds, and I know a lot of people are going to listen to this, and it's like, why wouldn't you just Uber eat something better? And it's like, yeah, most of the time, I'm good to do that. My normal backup plan is going to the grocery store across the street, picking up some of the things I didn't have, and just going to it. But since it literally wasn't right there, I think we've all had those days where you're just, your tank's on. Anything that gets mm -hmm. in your way is enough to throw you off. And that's what it did for me. It happens like that time to time. But the more often you can put a backup plan in place, if I just simply had, wasn't lazy and had a second dinner option plan in my fridge, I could have and would have cooked it, but I yeah. didn't because I live on my own. 
stupid guy thing to not have a full fridge. But that was just a little example. And I think a lot of people yeah. do that where it's like they have a great plan, a, a phenomenal plan A, and they've spent time putting it together, but they don't spend a few seconds just thinking about, okay, what if that doesn't happen? Because anyone with any sort of busyness in their life knows that plan A doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. Most of the time yeah. it probably won't. You're yeah. going to need a solid plan B and a lot of the time plan C's too. That's why I always prep on Sundays. Like I don't always prep full meals. Typically I'll do like lunch, but like I'll always prep two protein sources. So I'll cook some chicken and then whatever else my, my second one is for me, it's typically tofu. Uh, I'll batch make a thing of roasted potatoes. And then I also know I have some rice, like if I want it and I'll roast a big thing of vegetables. So I always have them in my fridge. Like I always have mm. the big, the big three to put together. And that's super, super helpful. Cause I just, I know I already made it. It's one thing to have the ingredients to cook whole mm. other to have already gone through the time of like I already cooked all of this. Oh, like yeah. I don't want to waste it. Like I don't want to waste it. It it really helps. Something I also do, I was just pulling up on my phone, is I just go and make, I don't even know if people who are watching this can see in my notes. Oh yeah. I'll do like Monday, Tuesday, like all of the weekdays, and I'll just do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I'll write out, type out what I want. Underneath that, I put all of the ingredients that I need before I go grocery shopping. And then I'll have like snacks and stuff that I want. But that's also being prepared. That's having some sort of plan. It's not having to meal prep every single one of those yeah. recipes, but you know what you're eating. So it's as simple it, as that. Really sometimes helpful. just a yeah. little forethought. Like how long does that list take you to make? Not long at all. And I'll usually make it when I'm like, I always make it on Saturdays when I do car cardio at the gym and it gets me through my cardio. Like I'm like, oh, okay. Like I'm going to go do an incline walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes and I'm going to make my grocery list. Like boom. And yeah. cardio goes by fast. I like reserve the time to do it. It's that's like the hat. I think that's habit stacking in my brain. I'm like I'm getting killing two birds with one stone here. Yeah. Cause I know some people hear it and they're like, well, I just don't have the time to meal prep or take all that time. That's a lot of energy. And I get that, but just like you put it out there, having a plan really could be as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Like how many yeah. times and, and think about when and why things can go wrong. Like I've had clients before where again, during the workday, they should have time to eat their lunch. Yeah. What if a meeting pops up? What if they cater and bring everything in? What if X, Y, or Z goes wrong? If you don't automatically just have a pre-thought out thing to do, a pre-thought out little solution to that, there could be a solution right in front of your face. But if you're busy, if you're going, you're not going to be able to see it. Or if you just yeah. thought it out beforehand, that's all it really is doing is putting that plan into place. That is number one. What are we doing on number two? So, so have a plan, be prepared. What's yeah. This one? And ha having a plan can really help you with number two, but having a regular, regular eating schedule. So not skipping your meals, not just eating whenever you feel like it. It doesn't matter if your eating schedule is two meals a day, if it's three larger meals, if it's five smaller meals, that does not matter. Those are the little nuances with weight loss that there's no right amount of meals. There's no right timing to eat. It's based off of what's best for you and also your environment. Because again, it depends on like the confines of your work schedule and whatnot. But if you are the type of person that thrives better on more meals per day or less, that's what you stick with as you want it to be consistent. So skipping meals, especially, I mean, if time gets in the way or say you're trying to scave off your hunger a bit, like, oh, I could just eat later. I'm going to save my calories for later. This really bites your ass when it comes, bite, yeah. bites your ass, bites you in the ass when it comes to adhering to your one deficit. So if you're trying to lose weight, but also if you are prone to overeating or even binging, we want to stay on top of that hunger so it doesn't get to the extreme high or low end. And when we are skipping meals, you're putting yourself in a position to have to fight off extreme hunger, which very few people could do. So mm -hmm. hunger will always inevitably catch up to you. And you want to keep these hunger and fullness hormones regular. And I say this is, I mean, we talked about this. This is what we're really trying to tackle with all of these steps. But trying to diminish them or pretend like they're not trying to tell you something only makes your production of these hunger and fullness hormones worse. So we want what we can't, if you are really hungry, it's not like you could just tell your ghrelin, Hey, like just disappear forever because I don't want to eat. I want to eat less. Yeah. That's not helpful. That's not helpful at all. But when you're also eating on a regular schedule, you're telling, you're preparing your brain in advance that, 
hey, this is our eating time. You're giving it something, you're giving yourself something to prime for digestion one. So when we have a consistent eating time, this also helps optimize digestion as well because our body starts to get used to the times as times when our digestion has to be at its peak and working most efficiently. So that's just like another perk. But you get into more of this consistency with your hunger and fullness hormone production, which is very helpful to making sure they're not on those extreme ends. So having that regular eating schedule is also just going to prevent you from having more periods of the day where you feel like your hunger is extreme and then you're eating to the point of over being overly full and it's just this yo-yo effect. And it can of, throw you off for days at a time. Yeah. You know, it yeah. can throw you off for days bleeding into the next day. And here's what was surprising that I learned off of the last episode we did about gut health and the gut microbiome is not even just the hunger and satiety hormones, which just an endocrine system as a whole, your hormone system runs better on a schedule, just mm -hmm. like the rest of your body, like your circadian clock, when your sleep and wake times are happy, a lot of other things are. When your eating time is regular and scheduled, your body likes it. And same thing with mm -hmm. your gut microbiome. That is a extremely diverse community of little guys down there. Yeah. Not, not you, right? You have more of them in your body than you do you or your own cells. It blows my mind, but that community is on a schedule, right? Just like you like to live, hopefully, your life on some sort of a schedule or you like routine. Most people thrive off of routine. Same thing with your gut microbiome too is where it's expecting foods at certain times and it's expecting to not have foods at certain times. So if you're just kind of messing with that, there's no real routine, there's no rhythm. That with the hunger, it's just your biology is going to end up fighting against you. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting to me because it sounds so silly, but it's like even your meals, your routine, same thing with the wake up time and sleep time, everything, everything matters. Yeah. But that was a good point. There's no perfect schedule, whatever is mm -mm. consistent. One meal a day, 50 meals a day, whatever you do. <laughs> Should we hit number three? Yes. All right. Number three. I know a lot of people are going to roll their eyes at this one. Slow down. <laughs> Slow the hell down. Right. Like just, that's, that's what I'm ta physically talking about. Chew your food, <laughs> slow down. Don't just garb it. We were talking about this. I know guys probably tend to do this more than girls, but I will almost eat without inhaling sometimes. Like it just With, goes mean, like without breathing, without breathing. Like you, in you do inhale your yeah. food. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. That's probably what I meant. But yeah, like I'll just inhale my, like I just don't breathe in between. I can't like it's gone in three minutes. Mm -hmm. It's like that. I feel like that's more of a male trait, but we've all been there. Oh we my God. No, I do that too. On the days. I mean, Tony and I were not very mindful eaters last two weeks. We were two weeks ago when we were in LA. No, we, you guys were recording for so long. It's like at the end of the day, my hunger, I was insatiable, but it's like, that's not consistently how I eat, but you know, oh my God, I was, uh, yeah. When you get time, in that like, mood, oh. <laughs> once I ate and sat down for dinner, I was like, what's next? Like, I'm still hungry. <laughs> Seriously, that was actually a challenge. But a lot of the time, it's just the slowing down piece. And I know if you're a busy person, yeah. you have a busy schedule, very tight schedule, you have kids, you have other priorities in life. Sometimes you're like, I don't have 15 spare minutes to just sit down and have my meal. My meal. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part is like when you're eating, just eat. When, and we're talking about that later. When you're doing whatever you're doing, just do that. But if you slow down, it works in several different ways. One of them does actually impact your hormone response. And this is just seen over and tested over again, not just leptin and ghrelin, but GLP-1, PYY, CCK, all these hormones that signal fullness to the brain. You can look and the slower you can eat, the more time you take to eat, the more time it has to send these signals to your brain saying, hey, we don't really need more. Like we're full, we're where we're at. Because if you're just inhaling your food, like I was just talking about, I do a lot of the time, like a bad habit. It's so easy to eat way past the signal of fullness, right? Where I'm just sitting there at the end of the meal. Oh my God, I feel like crap. My stomach is at 150%, way too mm -hmm. full. But I missed that because when I kept eating, I didn't feel when I was at 100% until 10 minutes later, I, I realized it was too late because those hormones and signals take time. It's not yeah. instantly processed by your body and your brain. So if you actually can slow down, even by just a few minutes, and we're going to talk later about distraction, but just by slowing down for a few minutes, you actually will feel full. You don't have to tell yourself to stop. You're like, dude, I'm just not that hungry. And mm -hmm. not only that, like we always forget this. Like what's the very first step in your entire digestive process? 
chewing food. Your mouth. You're chewing your food. That's it's not your throat swallowing. It's not your stomach to help digest it. It's not your small or large intestine. It's your mouth chewing your actual food. It actually improves digestive efficiency. And doing all of that just helps, I mean, with better absorption of nutrients, actually help activate those satiety centers, really just all reducing the, the need to eat more. And not only that, it just slows down gastric emptying on top of all this, which is a good thing how fast your body is emptying the food out of you. The longer you have food in your gut, I mean, think about this too. Where's ghrelin produced? In your stomach. Ghrelin's produced in your stomach. That, that, that hormone that's telling you you're hungry is produced in your stomach. One of those signals is if there's food there or not. So mm -hmm. think about these things. The slower you can eat, and it doesn't have to be a 30-minute meal. It can just be at, what, five minutes, 10 minutes. Just as even long taking time to put your fork, fork down, like putting your fork down and chewing versus yeah. and waiting into this is something I've learned just in, you know, when I've been, because I used to be a really fast eater, but putting your fork down and chewing and swallowing before you take your next bite. You don't need to time Ooh. yourself. Um, that sounds tough, but I like that. Yeah. I actually really like that rule. Yeah. But that's and like that's three. obviously more tedious, but over time you won't have to like really think about it. You'll just start eating slower. Yeah. So that's number three. Tips to prevent overeating. We have always be prepared. Regular schedule. Slow the heck down. What's number four? This one's gonna make people mad. Yeah. Stop dieting. So stop following these like a fad diets, trendy diets, trying to do these, like, anything that's targeted as like quick and, you know, a five, a five day juice cleanse, something extreme. Cause you're not talking oh, about is... just dieting to lose weight in general, right? No, like you're not just no. talking about like tracking your calories, going yeah. in a deficit. You're not talking about that. No, no. These more extreme fad diet, fad diets that cause you to eliminate whole food groups or go on a juice cleanse or really restrict your calories and eat way less than you actually should be eating. Going to these really extreme short-term crash diets that are not sustainable at all. Trying to follow the next trend, the sort of yo-yo dieting habit where people will start one diet, do it for a little bit, lose the weight, gain the weight back, try a different diet that are super res restrictive and extreme because this is not sustainable for the long term. We're trying to create these dietary habits, regardless of whatever your goal is, weight loss, gain, putting on muscle, maintenance, what have you. We're trying to build these dietary habits that we can keep for the long term. Even when our environment is changing, our goal is changing, we're changing, we still have the foundation laid out for healthy a healthy ex eating experience where we're not overeating or restricting or been eating. In short, this can look like trying to eat more whole foods in moderation, being able to have a Snickers bar or something and not feel like you need to eat 10 of those, like having this healthier relationship with what your diet is, not going to these extremes of cutting out this, this food's good, this food is bad. Because it works on two layers, doesn't it? Not just the physical, like the same physical changes of if you skip a meal, you're going to be hungrier the next meal. You're going to be hungrier the next mm -hmm. day. But even the second layer deep of the psychological thing of I'm doing the whole 30, I'm just cutting these foods out. Even if you yeah. are satiated, meaning you're eating enough food, you're not physically hungry over those 30 days or whatever your diet, your name's diet has an end date for. Yeah. Even if you're full that entire time, your, the psychological effect of not being able to have those things is usually going to come back and bite you. Because we were talking about that, like the people that will say like, how do you just have two Oreos? in one meal because we'll give that advice all the time like don't cut out oreos just have a couple don't have mm -hmm. the whole bag and people are like i don't get that and sometimes they don't realize they don't get that because they're used to saying no 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 so when they do try and introduce two oreos it ends up being the whole pack it yeah. ends up being the whole thing that's going to happen after a period no matter how much logic you put behind it whenever you cut something out and try and just slowly piece it back in you're not going to be able to just put that one piece no. no, no, So there's no. two different You're... layers to this one too. 
Mm -hmm. It becomes way that food that you deem off limits becomes way more enticing. You're going to crave it more. You're going to think about it more. The more often that you tell yourself no, that's why I always people will look at me like I'm crazy. And they're like, well, you studied, you have your master's in nutrition and you will recommend that people include Oreos at lunch regularly having two Oreos every single day as a part of their diet. Yeah, because this same person would get stressed and anxious about being around an Oreo because if they had one near them, they're going to eat the whole damn package versus having a healthy lunch is saving a little bit room for something that is fun, they really enjoy, and they have it, they satisfy a craving and move on and are not thinking about it. They're not overeating these foods anymore. They're not as enticing. You could be presented with these Oreos wherever you are, and you don't really care if you have one or not because you you know you can have one whenever you want. They're not... Mm -hmm off limits, but they are a moderation food. It's not something that's going to be a big part of your diet. So yes, these overly sugary, processed, calorie-dense foods can actually make a diet healthier, in my opinion, depending on your relationship with food. And people think I'm crazy for that. And that's just how our brain chemistry works. We are very, very smart. If you continue to deprive yourself of something that you really want, it's only going to become more enticing and exciting. And people who especially struggle with binge eating disorder, this is a a mood disorder. So those people have heightened reward reward responses in their brains. So these pathways are going to be way more sensitive to certain things like ultra palatable foods. They're going to become way more enticing. The response is going to be heightened compared to someone without binge eating disorder. So it's really important that we train our brains to look at this food as something that we are more neutral on and not swinging on one end of the pendulum. So this is really, yeah. really, really important. Well, um, I know people are going to immediately hear that. And that's my favorite thing is when people with so much background in nutrition, like you, or some of our favorite dietitians, like Zach, mm-hmm. that's what I've noticed is all of the best dietitians I've met are usually the ones that say, yes, you should include treats eating out, you should include that stuff in your diet because it just brings people back. You have to remember, no matter what food you think is the devil, no single one food, we've said this a million times, no one food can be healthy or unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Like a banana, a Snickers bar, no one food can be healthy or unhealthy. A diet as a whole can be healthy or can be unhealthy. But that's the important part. Because I know people listening to this are like, oh, but the seed oils, I I have to avoid everything seed oils. I have to avoid that one or two things. It's like, are you forgetting how much more complex your health is than one food or meal a day? Like your sleep health, maybe, how much body fat you have, how much lean muscle and strength you have, how much you move during the day, how you manage your stress, your relationships, all these other things. And it's like, no, that one food is going to really make an impact. No. And that's why I love those papers and examples that have people go on these diets where they include things like Big Macs or where Jordan Syatt did it, where he spikes his insulin every single day with like a type of candy, still loses weight, gets blood metrics tested. Every measurable outcome improves. And that's what my favorite argument about the, like against this is if you're like, oh, but this food is bad or this food you can't, the poison's in the dose always. And I promise you there's going to be a dose where you can include that in your diet and you will, you'll have zero measurable health, negative health outcomes. You can't yeah. point to exactly where, you're, where it's bad for your health. It's not something you need to worry about. Mm-hmm. It's not the food that is making you gain weight or contributing to poor health. It's the overconsumption of ultra processed food that can lead to weight gain, poor health outcomes, and nobody wants to hear that because that involves changing our behaviors, our whole lifestyle, Mm -hmm. dietary patterns, how we approach food, how our preconceived notions about food. We have to alter our value system a little bit. So a lot of change has to come from that and a lot more digging and you putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. If you are someone that for so long has overeaten I'll use myself as an example. For so long, I could not have peanut butter was the demon for me. It's calorie calorie dense when I was struggling Mm -hmm. with anorexia. Like that was my demise. I was so scared of it. I love it. I love peanut butter. It is so good. I've always loved it. Could never be around it. And then once I started to have it, I would binge eat a whole jar of peanut butter, which like I think about it. And it's so the fact that I could do that is like crazy to me now, but I would black out. I would eat the whole, whole damn thing. The thought of having peanut butter in my wherever I was living would 
I would have a visceral reaction to it because it's all I would think about if I had a little bit of it, the whole thing, like, God forbid I get stressed, I'm going to eat that whole thing. Now I I think I have two jars of peanut butter that I probably have to throw out because I forgot they were there because I slowly just started to allow myself to have it. But there were, t- I was really uncomfortable at first, like making sure I had it every day. Sometimes I would overeat a little bit. And then slowly over time, and this may sound crazy, like, dude, it's just peanut butter, but this is more for like the binge eating end of things too. Like if you really struggle with that, that is a huge discomfort to allow yourself to have these foods that you overeat because it's going to take some time. Like it's not just Mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're just going to be like, oh, it's fine. No, Mm -hmm. sometimes you're going to overeat a little bit and you just have to accept that. But eventually you'll be that person who's at a party and there's all the sweets at the table and you'll be able to think, am I hungry? Do I want this? Eh. No, Mm -hmm. like if I want, you know, that ice cream or piece of cake or cookie, I can have it whenever I want. And so I'm, I'm good. Or I can stop myself after having a single cookie. Like that's actually can happen. Or I could just have a spoonful of peanut butter and be cool. Like it may sound crazy to some people, but like. Well, that's what I was like to me years ago, that would have sounded like, what do you mean? Like you just black out and have a tub of peanut butter. You don't realize how common that really is with a lot of people. And how bad, like, if you really are in the dieting and you've been dieting your whole life, we talked to Ethan about that, Ethan Souple. Same Mm -hmm. thing. If you've been surrounded by the diet industry and diets your entire life, it's just going to push you further and further into that direction to where that is normal. Like, at the time, that was probably very normal for you. You know, it wasn't Uh, weird. It wasn't, like, it was. It was like I was was, ashamed of it. It's so crazy that I can talk about it with zero shame or guilt because it was just, now I look at it as like, yeah, of course I did that after what I did to my body and my mental state and how I viewed food. Of course I did that. That makes so mm. much sense. But then it was like, oh my God, I, it took me months to be able to like open up and, about it because I was so ashamed when this is something that people, so many people yeah. struggle with. So. so stop it. So stop dieting. Those are the, the diets with the names, the diets with an ending. Mm-hmm. It's not going to work. Yeah. It's not going to yeah. work, which leads us. To something a little separate. Now we ain't talking about food anymore. Tip number five. And everyone's going to roll their eyes when this comes out of my mouth. We should have had you say this one because I don't shut up about it. Freaking, you should give a crap about your sleep. Mm -hmm. Care about your sleep. Improve your sleep. And I'll give you a few reasons why. And if you still don't think that's legit, then okay, you don't have to. You don't have to. Sleep does a lot. We had a whole freaking episode on it. But it especially primes you and your body to overeat or to stay full, stay satiated, stay good. If you had the same eating schedule, the same level of preparedness, everything else that we're talking about today, if that all stayed the same, but the sleep aspect was either ramped up or ramped down, it would be nearly impossible to consistently not be overeating. The biggest reason is the hormonal aspect of things. And that's what a lot of these, what we're realizing have to do with. Your hormones, the the hormones in your body, the biology signaling you to do these things. And yeah, lack of sleep does these things. The two main ones that we've talked about before, ghrelin and leptin, which little reminder, ghrelin is the hunger signal. We want more food sent out by cells in your stomach, where leptin is that satiety or fullness hormone. So ideally, you, you, you know want... how I memorized it in school? I would say oh. ghrelin, like your stomach when you're hungry, it's like grr. <laughs> like a growl, you growl, grr, ghrelin. I don't know. So when you're hungry. Wait, that actually like made it stick. That's how I always would remember it. And then left it is the other one. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to start about using it every that. Every time I hear it. Yeah. I'm going to start using that. But ghrelin produced by the cells in your stomach saying, hey, we want food. We are hungry. Leptin is the opposite, right? The yin to the yang. That is the hormone secreted by fat cells in your body that signal to the brain that you are full, that you are satiated. And interesting side note on leptin, but this is also why the reason the longer you are in a calorie deficit or the more weight you lose, typically the less leptin you produce, which is not Mm. a good thing because it's going to mean you feel more hungry. That's leptin is the signal to turn things down. And that's produced by your fat cells. So as you lose and lose and lose weight and lose fat, less of that signal gets sent out. And people don't typically realize that. So when you look at the actual impact on sleep, I think it's important to put numbers to this because the research is actually pretty clear on this. And where it looks at leptin and ghrelin changes, as little as one bad night of sleep can make a very significant change 
in your endocrine and hormone function. A study published in the Journal of Sleep Research found that individuals who were sleep deprived just one night of under five hours saw an increase in ghrelin by up to 28% the next day. Grr, ghrelin, that's the hunger hormone. 28% more of that just the next day from one bad night's sleep. And not only that, but a study in the Annals of Internal Medicine showed that one single night of bad sleep led to 15 to 20% decrease in leptin levels the following day. So not only are you sending out more I'm hungry, but less I'm full. It's a double whammy, whatever you want to call it. Your biology is literally fighting against you. And we've talked about this a million times. You can have a really strong why, and that's going to help you stick to it. You can be the most motivated person in the world, but if your literal biology, the cells in your body are fighting and pulling you in one direction, you're going to eventually go there. You Mm -hmm. cannot beat hunger when it's coming from the body, when you've done all the right things. This is where it's like you can eat foods that should fill you up, but you're still starving. A lot of the time it's because these signals are being sent and you don't have an understanding why. And sleep is one of the biggest thing. I mean, that's one bad night of sleep. I, most people notice that if they get a crappy night's sleep, right? You're just, you're hungry the next day. You're cranky. You want a little bit of extra treats, whatever yeah. it is. Well, it's I also brought, brought this, I don't remember when I brought it up, but improving your sleep, also improving like your bedtime. So the later we stay oh, up, yes. the, low, the lower our inhibitions are. So we just have less control later into the night. I mean, how many people have had a day where they're just, oh, I hit all my calories, like hit all my macros, ate great. All of a sudden it's fucking 11 at night. You know what? The, the, my fitness pal isn't that noisy right now. Like mm, I could just like eat this. Or if you're craving something, you're more likely to eat it later into the night. Uh, that's just how it goes. So if you have an earlier bedtime, if you're not giving yourself that opportunity, more time to eat. Uh, that is, I'm not saying like go to bed right after dinner. I'm not saying that at all, but especially for the, the night hours, people who stay up later and some people may not eat at all when they're staying up. It's still, you still want to make sure you're getting good sleep, but that is something you can work that's on. A- yeah. I, I'm, well, I'm I was- so glad you brought it up. Cause whenever I'm like up late or watching Netflix or whatever, those thoughts in my head, just like grabbing a little more snack, doing extra this. Just it's a little sign. Yeah, yeah. A little something, something. Mm-hmm. Your inhibitions are lowered. Yeah. That can easily knock you off. That can easily knock mm-hmm. you off. Which leads us into number six. Yes. Another big one. And this one we've talked about all the time. But the tip, the rule, the whatever you want to call it, is not just to eat more protein, but if you can, structure each meal around protein. Right? Mm. Do that and... It's one of the biggest impacts I think you can make, at least on like an immediate scale. Sleep, stress, which we're going to talk about later. These things take like weeks, months to really improve, to fix, especially Mm -hmm. stress. Eating more protein is something you can do right now or with your next meal that will have an immediate positive feedback. Because like we just know this, one thing always happens when you eat more protein, and that's that you eat less total food. That always happens when you increase how much protein you're eating. A study we brought up before, done at Maastricht University, awesome job highlighting this. And we've gone deeper into previous episodes. But this is the study we've referenced where they split participants into three separate groups. And they didn't give these participants any other instruction, not to lose weight, not to exercise more, not to do anything. But they were just going to say and observe their total daily intake when the only instruction given was that group one, had to eat 5% of their total calories from protein. Group two had to eat 15% and group three had to eat 30% of their calories from protein. doesn't matter how much you eat, when you eat anything, as long as you're getting that much protein out of your meals and out of your day. Mm. What are we shocked to find over and over again? They observed at the end of the day what each group's calorie intake was. The groups who ate just 5 and 15% protein, so the lowest amounts, had an average calorie intake of just under 2,300 calories per day. Not bad. Not too shabby if you ask me. But the group who increased their protein to 30%, 30% of their food was coming from protein, their intake was over, just over, 1,700. That's almost 600 fewer calories every day without thinking about it, without trying to diet, without doing anything else because you're just full. And what happens when you're truly full? You don't want more Food. food. <laughs> and you might be like batting your eye like five, 600 calories a day. 
that's a pound a week. Yeah. That's over huge. over time. That's a straight up pound a week difference in yeah. changes that are making. And that's intuitively lowering your calories. Not they right? They didn't try intentionally yeah. do it. Exactly. That they didn't say try to lose so weight, try and impactful. Eat less. Yeah. Yeah. Because how many times do we get asked about that of how do I lose weight without tracking my food? How do I get away from tracking overall? Protein is the best mm -hmm. thing that can do that for you. It does all the things that we've talked about. It has the same impact on all of those hunger hormones, GLP-1, leptin, ghrelin, all of these. And not only I think the satiation factor, but I think most people relate to this. After a meal that they have a lot of protein, it's not a fatty fried source they generally feel a little bit more like stable after their mood, their energy, their fatigue usually feels a little bit better. And this is recognized in research over and over again, too, is especially people in a calorie deficit, if they have a high protein intake, it helps stabilize their mood, their fatigue, their emotional reactions, all of these things you might bat an eye at, but that matters. Mm -hmm. The more stressed you are, the more likely you are to overeat. The worse mood, the more fatigue you feel, the more you're going to want to overeat. Protein is just like a nice little soft blanket. Maybe it's like a little weighted blanket that just pushes things down. It holds you and says, hey, everything's going to be all right. Yeah. Except you don't have to think about it because who likes yeah. thinking about food? Nobody. I do like. I <laughs> okay, never mind. That's Mariana's I get excited job. to cook. <laughs> but thinking about their own food and their own diet in that yes, sense. No. You can think about like, food's freaking awesome. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, no one likes I, to think and constantly be worried about it. Having it taking up all this like brain space. I fuck. I, sorry. I hate being hungry. I like a little bit, but I hate when I'm like in a position where I cannot act on my hunger and it's just like, or I'm so frustrated if I eat a whole meal and I'm like, shit, like, why am I still hungry? What did I do? This is so annoying. It is an and annoying feeling. Those, those feelings all the time when I was vegan and not eating enough protein ever. Even um, though this might sound effed up, I hope we don't have to cut this out, but when I'm dieting, you have to give me the thumbs up or thumbs down this one. Mm -hmm. When I'm dieting, I, I don't want to say that I liked the feeling of hunger, but over time I looked for it. Because if you're losing significant weight, if you're in a deficit, if you're losing weight, you're going to have periods of hunger through the day. You shouldn't be starving around the clock, yeah. but you're going to have periods of the day where you experience hunger. If that's before meals, if that's maybe right before bed, you're going to have that. And in my brain, I taught myself to kind of enjoy that because I'm like, okay, this means it's working. And I know that can be destructive for a lot of people if that's what they think about. Don't think about that. But for me, it was like, okay, I did what I set out to do today. I know the scale is probably going to be trending down over the next few days. I, like, I, I kind of liked it. Now it's annoying as hell. But if I'm in a deficit, I almost have to like trick myself into liking it. Is that messed up? Mm. So that's the thing. Like people get triggered by shit all the time with like disordered eating and eating disorders, what have you. Someone who like had one, it's not fucked up because you have a normal chemical response to that idea. It's not like I get high off of this feeling of being hungry. Yeah. I'm going to eat as little as possible. And if I yes. don't feel hungry, I'm doing something wrong. And so for me, like if like hunger was like I would chase it in a way that was like so fucked up mm. because – I was just, I never wanted to feel like I had food in my stomach. Like I, that's, I mean, that's anore anorexia is like you thrive off of yeah. the feeling of like that, that's success. I've done something right. Not like a, oh, this is a good sign that like I'm adhering to my deficit and this is going to push me towards my goals. A hundred percent. I honestly like hearing the different perspectives. You can have those thoughts to some people. That's why I hate when people, oh, that's triggering to me. Like, no, this is. Tony doesn't have that brain, that thought process. There's like, a, that's, yeah, there's that's a right normal. and wrong way to like, do everything. Like two people like that do that. For me, one... that's not normal. But for someone, for, for someone like Tony, that's normal. And it's not, I don't think it's negative at all. Yeah, like a healthy response. But, I was like, this sounds yeah. bad. I've never said out loud, but I'm like, that sounds bad. Mm. But it can be done right and wrong. So it helps. Now, yeah. that leads us though, increasing the protein, structuring each meal around protein. This is the only other aspect of spe like really specific food that we're trying to increase here is number seven. Yeah. Yeah. So this is increasing your fiber intake. And if you do fiber and protein, like you are solid, you are Cake. setting yourself up for success on tackling, you know, your overeating and really being in tune with that hunger and fullness, not having hunger be so loud. Okay. So fiber, 
what the main mechanism at play here is the fact that fiber moves slowly through your digestive tract, which keeps you fuller longer, specifically soluble fiber. So it dissolves in water and forms this gel-like material in your gut. So this gel slows the emptying of your stomach. It increases digestion and absorption times, aka fiber slows the speed of digestion. And the end result is a prolonged feeling of fullness, increased satiety, and reduced appetite. So this is going to significantly decrease the likelihood of you overeating the meal that you're sitting down to eat and also eating, you know, five, 10 minutes later, reaching for food really quickly after not feeling satisfied. I, and there's so many foods with fiber, but you do have to, this is where the planning and preparing comes into Mm. place. Like you, this is going to come from more of the whole foods, foods you have to cook, prepare. There are like quick sources would be like your chia seeds, your flax seeds. You can just add them to a smoothie, your yogurt, But it's hard to accidentally eat. Like you don't, most people don't accidentally get too much fiber. Like it's, it's not those kind of foods. Yeah. So foods high in fiber, you're like oatmeal, peas, beans, any legumes, so lentils, Apples, pears, berries, avocados, citrus fruits, any of your cruciferous vegetables, so like Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli, even sweet potatoes and squash. So all whole foods, right? So you're going to have to prepare them. There are going to be some easier sources, like just, you know, adding some berries to your your yogurt in the morning, really high in fiber. But I I wish I liked beans so much more. Beans are a hack for fiber. They're just, I think they're disgusting. Like I just gag thinking about them. But they're a hack. I like love hack. them. You had beans mm-hmm. to your tacos. That's your entire daily fiber intake. Because the goal here, and I think more specifically, is like around 14 to 15 grams per thousand calories eaten. But an easier way to think of that is like setting a male or female goal. If you're a guy, mm-hmm. aim for this. If you're a girl, aim for this. Which, what are those numbers? Yeah. yeah, I would just even say for everyone, like, so this is a little bit easier, but 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day. Guys, yeah. at uh, reach more towards the higher end of that. So between mm. 30 and 35 women, you know, you can reach for the lower end. Uh, but you want to consider your starting point. So I really recommend if you don't know kind of how much fiber you're eating, take a week or two, just log your meals in my fitness pal, look on an app. Av- average how much fiber you're getting daily because most Americans are not meeting their recommended daily fiber intake. They're not actually even far close. below it. I think the average is like 10 grams per day. So you do not want to go from 10 grams per day to 30 grams per day. This is going to tax your digestive system. It is going to be uncomfortable. You're going to feel bloated, right? We need to work our way into it. So looking at where you're starting at and then start by increasing your daily intake by five grams per day that week. The next week, do it by another five. Slowly get to that goal. Don't do it all at once. It's so funny. If you do it, you'll find out why if you do it too fast, but yeah, you're going to sit on that toilet and you're not Mm going to get up. But the most, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to, I was going to say fun fact that I just looked up after that, but go for what you were going to say first. Oh, I was just going to say the most fascinating thing I fascinated benefit, I think, to eating more fiber is how it increases both satiety and satiety and satiation, which people think satiety, they stay thin, they like kind of group them as one, but they're different and to fiber targets both. Satiety is the feeling of fullness that persists after eating. So if you eat a meal and for two or three hours, you're still feeling good, which is what we want. We want to not have to Mm -hmm. reach for food after just eating and because it affects the length of time between eating intervals. And satiation is the satisfaction of appetite that occurs during the eating Mm. occasion and actually causes you to stop eating. So the satiation effect is what will tell you. It's one of the signals to be like, hey, put your fork down. You're done eating. Don't finish your meal. So both combined, like that targeting both of those is going to be huge. I didn't know that. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Fiber. Well, because people don't think about that where it's interesting when, you know, you start working with like a client and you start getting used to paying attention to different hunger cues. Most people just aren't used to paying attention to hunger cues at all Mm -hmm. on a daily basis. But then when you even get to that point where it's like, okay, is this, are we hungry here or are we craving something here? And that big, big difference of like, well, wait wait a second. I don't know. Well, Well, I think you told me that test. If you don't know if it's hunger or cravings. What the real test is, is like actually used beans as an example, I think. Mm -hmm. But it's like if someone put a bowl of beans in front of me 
and I wanted to, I was like, I actually, am, I'm hungry. I want to eat that. That's hunger. If I'm mm-hmm. like, no, nah, I don't need those. That's craving. That's say satiety. That's what that piece is, right? Yeah. Is- it's appetite actually. So like there's a huge difference between appetite and hunger and appetite and cravings can be mm-hmm. lumped similar in a similar grouping, but that's where you get the the really formal definition of this huge difference between, you know what? I do not want to eat any food right now, but someone's bringing that cake over for dessert and chocolate cake is my favorite. So now I have the appetite for it. I'm not hungry, but my appetite is, is peaked and I can make room. That's absolutely that's appetite. It's, but it's so important to know because it's important to realize there's different techniques to target each of those. Yeah. If you're experiencing that appetite or if you're experiencing hunger, there's things that you do. And that's why it's interesting. Fiber can do both. It's because some people might be trying to attack hunger, not realizing that it's a craving that's throwing them off. So every Mm -hmm. technique you try and use to curb your hunger is going to have no impact over here because you're trying to solve the wrong problem. And that's a lot of those like restricting diets and things like that. It's like you could be as full as you want. You can volume eat. You can do all those tricks. That's trying to solve hunger. It's not going to solve your, say, Mm -hmm. your appetite, your appetite piece of things. Yeah. And one quick thing I want to mention, like this isn't to say like, I don't know, I'm the type of person who after lunch or dinner, like I always need a little something sweet. That's my appetite. I always need a little sweet treat. It doesn't matter what it is. That is my appetite. And I know it's going to win even when I'm physically full. So what I do is I make room in my lunchtime or my dinner time. I never eat to the point of complete fullness. I still have a little bit of hunger left. Because I know like my appetite, I, I want a little something sweet. So I just fit it in to my meal time versus I, I could finish eating. This typically happens at dinner, not at lunch. Depends. But typically at dinner, I'll be like, oh, you know what? Like I'm really full. I don't need anything sweet. And even an hour later, I'm like, I'm not hungry, but, but... I want some dark chocolate really, really bad. Mm-hmm. So it's just you you tap into it. Yeah. You Everyone's different and you can kind of use them to your advantage because mm-hmm. if yeah, I know I'm going to want something know. anyway, like the difference yeah important to know the difference which okay before we move on to the next one this is what i just looked up apparently what's reported this is bs is that the average daily fiber intake for americans is 15 grams a day that's baloney that's baloney because i I was given this example on the previous time we recorded this 80 90 percent of the time when i start working with someone new and we start just tracking their diet how it is not trying to change anything about it not aiming to do anything different, increase protein fiber, just let's pay attention first and then we'll know exactly where we need to be. It is not uncommon for a daily fiber intake between like five and eight grams. It is not uncommon yeah. to be single digit fiber intake because the food's fiber and it's not accident. You don't accidentally eat a, a bowl of berries or these apple and even berries and apples don't have anything compared to like beans or like these leafy green vegetables that have a lot of fiber in them. You don't yeah. act, most people don't accidentally eat these things. So look it up because that cracked me up. I'm like, I wonder what the average daily intake is. 15 is, I would bet money it's lower. I yeah. bet money it's lower. <laughs> now let's round this list off. We got up to seven so far. What are the final three? Okay, so number, number eight. Eight. So this is practicing the two minute rule. Hear me out on this one. What's that? I feel like this is really, really helpful for both camps of like overeating versus a binge. But I really think the people who struggle with binge eating, which is more of this sub, we have, I didn't explain this yet, but I should have. Binge eating, when you have a binge eating episode, you don't feel like you're driving your car almost. You don't feel like you're in control of your actions. It's kind of this like blacking out. I'm yeah. eating. I want to stop. But I have no control over my body. I all, all of a sudden I get this craving and this desire to binge and I'm acting on it and I've already binged and don't even feel like the time between me feeling like a binge was coming on and me finishing it. I feel like I it was non-existent. It happened so quick. This almost gluttony, glutton, gluttonous behavior. Overeating is, I mean, people do it all the time. We accidentally overeat all the time, eating past the point of fullness. You still have that conscious awareness. It's still uncomfortable. It's still not something you enjoy, but it lacks that almost automatic, like I did this without any conscious thought whatsoever. I was not in control of my body type of feeling to the point where you're eating everything you could possibly get your hands on. I just wanted to make that distinction. So what is the two minute rule? 
So the two minute rule is from the point of you feeling this desire to eat, or maybe you're feeling a craving for something. Maybe you feel like I might have a binge eating episode or something coming on. Taking two minutes, walking away from the kitchen, it's doing some deep breathing. So breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth for literally two minutes and just take a second because what we're trying to do is delay a behavior that could become automatic or just reaching for something based off of our desires, based off of our cravings, doing something without that conscious control over your actions. So we're taking back that control of just acting on, oh my God, I'm really, really hungry. I need to eat something as fast as possible. I just need to order food right now. Or I'm really craving something. Fuck it. I'm just going to eat this whole tub of ice cream. You make it a choice is what you're doing. Yes. Like you're you're just making it a choice is what this two minute rule does, right? Yeah. Yeah. So just taking a second to bring back that control. And typically why I say this may be geared more towards people who struggle with binges is because before a binge and during a binge, but when you really get that craving, that desire to eat, it is this, you're tapping into a part of your nervous system. So your sympathetic nervous system, your body is in that fight or flight mode. You are not in, Mm -hmm. you're not going to be optimally primed for digestion, which is your parasympathetic state, but you're going to act quickly and it's, you are not going to have more of this conscious control, conscious thought. You're not going to be in a relaxed state where you can make optimally make decisions. When we do this deep breathing exercise, we are shifting from that sympathetic nervous state to parasympathetic, which is rest and digest. We have more control. We have we are primed for digestion and we can make decisions not just based off our desire to act on a feeling or a craving. Yeah. So that's really what this is doing is you're taking back control in just those two minutes just taking the time to actually think about the decision you're about to make. Is it in line with my goals? Is this going to make me happy in the end? Is there something else I should do? Do I already have food in the fridge that I could eat versus reaching for the ice cream? Taking that time to actually think it through. And I think it's even more honestly than just binging, but how helpful this rule could be in every aspect of your life outside of your health. Like I was even talking in a relationship. If you guys are in a heated back and forth and you're in an argument, Take two seconds because a lot of the time those emotions are driving you to say or do things that you normally would not say. It's almost like thinking it's easy when you observe, like have the chance to step back and observe all the moving pieces, how simple some of these choices become. And I don't like using a sports analogy because it doesn't connect with a lot of people who don't watch sports. If it's females or you just don't like sports, but I think this one really makes a lot of sense is even if you don't watch them, you're familiar with the people. I don't know if you are actually definitely being up by the Pats in the, in Boston, but the people who will sit at the TV and they'll say that was such a stupid decision that that athlete made in the moment. Why didn't he just do this? He had the ball, the game was over. Why didn't he just take a knee instead of keep running where he fumbled it, whatever it was. It's easy because you are sitting back. You have every piece of information right in front of you. When you're that athlete, you're so narrow tunnel vision in that second where you don't have all that data. You don't get to make that decision. You, you're deciding between one and two things, maybe. Not the 10,000 different things that you can decide on when you're sitting back from it. And that's what it does in every other aspect of life. It's just that skill of pausing. And that's where we talk about the whole mindful eating aspect or where I really, like the biggest benefit I got from putting a meditation practice into my life is it doesn't make you like magic or f- be able to focus on one or two things, even though it kind of does I inadvertently. Mean, it just allows you to be like the person who's observing everything that's happening around you. Because most people listening to this, especially if you're someone who came into this episode saying, oh, I'm a person who overeats. I binge. I do all these things. You probably doubt your decision making just oh, as a person. For, a lot of you people don't trust like, yourself. You don't like, trust yourself. Yeah. But I promise. But it's always because you're putting yourself in these positions where you are not really the one deciding, right? You're, yeah. you're blacking out. You're not the one deciding. And it's shocking. We have a really smart audience. Our listeners, super cool, super smart, intelligent people. I think most people, even outside of that, people who listen to the Gary Brecker show, those kind of people. But I think even everyone outside of that, if you really have a time to make the decision, I think most people are smart enough to make a good decision. 
But mm -hmm. the people who doubt that are the ones who are always putting themselves in position where they can't really make the right choice. Yeah. They can't make yeah. a good decision because they're not in a position to. All we're saying is once you shift positions, you would be shocked at how much easier it is to say no or to go here or to, to lessen the blow. It's shocking. Yeah. And the thing with binge eating too, that is like, I try to look at things that, you know, I'm behaviors when I'm trying to change them and I try to really understand them and look at them from a, even if it's a behavior I really don't like about myself or I'm ashamed of, or I feel guilty of, but I'm really working at changing it. I try to really understand it and why it happens because our actions, they're saying something like we're acting for a reason. So really understanding, I really was always fascinated by this urge. So it's like the binge eating urge. Like I have this urge to binge. It's mm. almost like you have this urge for a cigarette, not the same thing, but you know, kind of that I need it. Not the same thing in the sense of like how, how addiction happens between food. Yeah. I'm not going to get yeah. into that, but that feeling of having this urge and then acting on it. I was always so fascinated by how quickly people act on the urge versus why mm. why is that and learning about how powerful the time between urge the urge and the binge is for stopping a binge because the urge can go away so even if we do mm. find out oh we're actually hungry we need a meal but this urge this thing that is almost like so enticing you feel it's taking over your mind you start to like yeah. i need to do this or else something bad is going to happen or i can't think about anything else until i do this if you breathe through that discomfort go do something else or just take a step back for two minutes you are going to shift that automatic that automatic action okay mm -hmm. like okay I, I i worked through this urge now what do I need? Maybe it might be that I need a full meal or just a little bit something. It, but that is so, so powerful, being able to recognize it and just extend it a little bit, like work through that discomfort. Like you'll hear people say for binging, like, oh, just like go for a walk, just ignore it. No, I'm not saying ignore it. You're not, you're going to feel it completely. Yeah. Like you're going to mm -hmm. work through it completely. I just say like, go for a walk, just like get away from the fridge. So you don't have that like external stimuli of in yeah. your face. No, it's not just going to go away. It's going to take some time and it's going to be really uncomfortable. But the most powerful part of this is, is that you're even recognizing it in the first place. It may take a month of just, I recognize that this is going to happen. You might still overeat or binge afterwards, but I still recognized it. I took the two minutes. Shit. That's I huge. binged after, but yeah. you will, it will start to over time. You'll be able to stay more on top of preventing the urges from happening. Not so much the binge, but tackling that urge, fewer urges, fewer binges. So I just yeah. think that that's really fascinating. Because progress like that, right? It takes time, Like you're not just going to be able to mm -hmm. flip a switch and be like, oh, I paused perfectly and I never binge ate again or over ate again. <laughs> yelled at my spouse or made a bad business yeah. decision, whatever. That's not how it works. If you're someone going through that, realize and freaking celebrate. If you can now identify when you're feeling that urge before it happens, that is massive. Like being able to yeah. see that in the first place is so freaking huge. Because yeah. as soon as you see that, and that'll happen even sooner, as soon as you see that, you'll know, okay, what I'm about to do or say is not what I probably want to do or say. Let me take a step mm -hmm. back. Like you can still go into it, but you know, okay, this is clouding my vision or this is clouding what yeah. I'm actually seeing. So mm -hmm. powerful. Sorry, That's that was one. long winded. That's one of the most helpful tools I've implemented in my life, not just for eating, but yeah. for everything is the two minute Because well, we're such impulsive no. human beings like act on what like we desire. How often like, our desires drive a lot of our actions and like just what we want animals. and that instant gratification. Like we're just freaking animals, sentient yeah. apes. Roaming around, drinking Starbucks. <laughs> number best. nine, number nine. This one I'm guilty of big time. And that is to limit distractions or to avoid eating while you're working, watching TV, doing something else. Like that was, I, I told you, I'm not big on New Year's resolutions, but one of my bigger goals, because I realized I moved away from it the last year, was just in that simple quote of like, be where your feet are. When you're eating, just eat. When you're reading the newspaper, just read the newspaper. When you're going on a walk, just go for a walk. Like, don't be doing 10 things at once or be thinking about this or that. If I'm going on a walk now, leaving my phone behind, because that's huge. And this has been demonstrated in research over and over again, too. It's almost impossible to stop eating more food if you're distracted. 
almost impossible. Not yeah. just from the psychology that we talked about earlier of just getting yourself to slow down and recognize those hunger and fullness cues, but just to even notice them in the first place. I mean, for example, yeah. a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that participants who ate while watching TV consumed up to 52% more calories than those who just ate without a distraction, who just were at the dinner table. 52% more. That is not a small number. That's a difference between a meal being 800 calories and 1,200 calories, 1,000 calories and 1,500 calories. So if you're always just scrolling on your phone, that's a big one for me, on my phone or throwing up the next mm -hmm. episode on Netflix, whatever it is, it's easy to do it. And I know you were telling me last time how you do that if you're reading sometimes, like reading a book and you just have a bag of nuts, pistachios, something there. Well, you're I can't, go yeah, I the can't read out. and eat. Because I will get it so my I usually don't, but recently I did, and I had some pistachios, and all of a sudden I'm like stopped, looked up to freaking from my book, and I'm like my stomach, I feel sick. Why did I, I just ate yeah. all of those? There's no fucking way. But that just it was like a reminder of like, oh, this is. I actually have gotten really, really good as I never eat when I'm reading or when I'm watching something. I, but I forgot that I, I literally forgot that I was that type of person because I never do it anymore. But I used to like, if I was eating, I used to always eat in front of the TV or my computer or phone yeah. or something. And then I would look up and be like, oh my God, wait, I'm full. Shoot. Especially <laughs> like I'm well, too I was, full. And not saying you can never do this because I still most no. nights will turn on Rhett and Link, Good Mythical Morning on YouTube while I eat my dinner. Shout out to the mm -hmm. best YouTube channel on planet earth. And I'll still do that, but at least when I'm doing it, I make sure I don't have, I'm trying to think of like a, a clever term to put this as, I don't have a never-ending- It's like never you could have ending, a pre-portioned meal. Like, yeah. I don't have a never-ending yeah. bag of something. My five yeah, tacos, yeah, yeah. my turkey tacos, I'll have those five on a plate and the next closest thing of food is way over in the kitchen. Yeah. I'm going to have to make yeah, yeah, that yeah. decision to go get that. So when I'm done, I'm done. But if I had a bag of chips or a bag of popcorn or a bag of yes. nuts or just something there, a bowl of something- zero chance, zero yeah. chance that whole thing wouldn't be empty. Or I'd be like you just saying, like, just sick. It, should, yeah. it just, the distraction impairs your awareness around how much food you've already consumed. Mm -hmm. So it's just a big yeah. one. So most people have heard that is for real, which leads us to number 10, the final tip of the day. This one ain't easy. This one is not easy to do. It's to manage your stress. Immediate eye roll. I know. I hear that from everybody. Immediate eye roll. Not easy. Easier said than done. It's easy for you to say, try having five kids at home. Try having to work two jobs. Try having to do X, Y, or Z. I understand. Everybody's got stress in their life, stressful things in their life. We're not talking about getting rid of those stressful triggers or the things that give you stress. We're talking about managing that better and how you handle those stressful things in your life. Yeah. How you handle those five kids. Is it causing stress or not? Because we're going to talk about the hormonal, the psychological, even the impact on your gut brain axis here in a minute. But uh, we use this example, which I absolutely love, where if you're sitting in traffic, I, I love this analogy, because when you're just sitting in bumper to bumper traffic, look around for a few minutes, just pause and look around. And you're going to see people who are white knuckled face to the steering wheel, laying on their horn. And you can probably tell just by looking at them what kind of mood they're in, how much stress they're experiencing. They're just angry. They're red. They're fuming. That's a stressed out person. They're going to get home, put their clothes down, talk to their wife and be like, why are you in a bad mood? Oh, I was just stuck in traffic and it was all this. But if you look around, you're also going to see maybe the car next to you who's got the windows down. Maybe they're listening to their favorite podcast or episode of FS Pod and they're just enjoying the breeze. They're hanging out. They're controlling it. Both people are in traffic. Traffic is not what's causing the stress. It's you. You're yeah. the one that's doing these things. And I know it, it's some of these stressful things you can't handle. It's, so. it's an acutely stressful situation. That is objectively true. You're going to have acutely stressful situations every single day. It's whether or not you allow them, those situations, to seep into your life and affect your well-being, how you approach your neck the rest of your day, how you're feeling. If you take them with you every single day and it starts to build up and become this chronic stress, yeah. not just this is a stressful situation. It sucks recognizing that and moving on, but it really 
like you taking that in and it actually affecting your overall mental state, how you go about other actions throughout the day, how you take it with you throughout the rest of your week, right? It's not a saying that you could just like certain situations are not going to be stressful, but it's that chronic stress and that day to day, week to week, month to month, year over year type of stress that really, really affects you. I, I feel like what we were talking about before we came on earlier is the perfect example of how you can let stress like have so much power over you or not. But with our podcast that we recorded in LA, oh, yeah. went out there for a week, like found out we can't use any of those episodes. Yeah. I obviously like going to react to that, going to be frustrated, going to be stressed we, out about it. We had a But mode. like I gave, like I personally gave myself, I'm like, you know what? For Monday, I'm going to allow myself to be pissed. I'm allowed myself to spiral a little bit because I can't just push it away. I'm feeling this, but I'm waking up Tuesday morning and it's, we're moving forward. It's not, we're not dwelling on it. We're not going to try and change something we can't change or have no control over it versus it seeping into the rest of my week and my behaviors following. But that's just an example. That's the hard part about stress and, and someone who goes through like big, objectively what people would consider like a very stressful situation because Mm -hmm. the hormonal response, the psychological response, the negative things that come from stress can be so freaking different where someone with five kids and two jobs could have a lower relative feeling of stress than someone who just sat in 10 minutes of traffic, but lives on, you know, in Hawaii on the beach and has Mm -hmm. nothing. That person can still have a reaction that elicits way more negative effects from stress than the person with five kids, two jobs, X, Y, Z. You can't avoid any of these things and they're going to cause, like Mariana just said, there's going to be times that you just cannot help that. Yeah. But you can really improve how you manage it and how long Mm -hmm. these things hold on to you. Because the main hormonal response that you're going to get is, and everyone's heard this before, cortisol is the stress hormone. And we do our best to not label things as good or bad because your body, let's not forget, needs cortisol. And it can be super helpful at certain periods of the day. If you want to wake up feeling refreshed and energized, that's due to a natural cortisol spike in the morning. Without that, you'd be Mm -hmm. feeling groggy. You couldn't think straight. You couldn't pull yourself out of bed. Cortisol isn't just a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But if it's chronically elevated from these stress and how much you're really carrying onto this, it just bleeds into every decision you make. And not only this, there actually was a really cool paper done by the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. And it showed that individuals with higher blood cortisol levels, just that measurement alone, are much more likely to exhibit behaviors of binge eating. So to that extreme of things, Mm -hmm. those occurrences happen much more with people who carry more cortisol over time. That's not saying crush cortisol, boo cortisol, but if you're chronically carrying too much of it, that's a problem. And it influences all of the hunger hormones that we've talked today. It's just, it's tough. And and this is not even talking about the psychological. I mean, everyone's heard of emotional eating, emotional eating. And Here's where this is what I think we were talking about this because I feel like people are either in one of two camps of either when they get super stressed, they can't stop eating. Like it's this, this unsatiable feeling they have, or I was in this group too. You kind of lose your appetite. Like you're just not hungry at all when you go through too much stress. And one thing I want you to be careful of, if you're like in that camp of like, no, yeah, I get stressed. Who cares? But I, I don't have the emotional eating, my appetite goes away. But what I don't think people realize is how often when their appetite goes away, they're feeding their body significantly less, that body, that machine that's running that kind of needs fuel. Mm -hmm. So you might not eat as much that day or the next day, but starving your body for several days, I would bet my money causes you to overconsume for the next week. And you're eating just more and more because your body's still in that debt of like, yo, I'm hungry. Because I used to tell myself that. I'm like, dang, I, I'm just not an emotional eater. My appetite goes away. Not me realizing as soon as that stress was lifted, I'd be eating twice as much as I normally would. It's insane. And then the last impact yeah. is just on the gut brain access, which stress really can impact this. I think this is one of our big tips when we were talking about how to improve your gut health overall, right? Was really working on your stress. Your stress is really closely related to your gut health and that gut brain access. And that just alters your digestion, your appetite regulation. And that's the, the, the stuff that we talked about on gut health. That's not an easy fix. That's one of those fixes that takes 
real freaking time to change. You can't just flip a switch yeah. and be like, oh, I just altered the makeup of my gut microbiota. You can't do yeah. that. That takes yeah. a long freaking time. It takes a long time. Yeah. It's like making sure you have the like, daily stress management in your routine is going to be so, so important because it's going to help keep those cortisol levels at bay. It's not going to make your life less stressful. There's, it doesn't mean that, but it's going to change how you respond to it and how it affects you um, on a physiological level. Uh, so, I mean, it, it can really be anything that I think is like, I think of something being for you, like doing something for you every single day. For some yeah. people that might be meditation, great. For some people that genuinely might just be in carving out time to go to the gym. It could be just going through. It could for be even walk. on your phone, on social media. Like I just 15 minutes of doom scrolling. Isn't doom scrolling to some people? That's helpful after a long day. Yeah, something just for you. Like that's, it doesn't have to be, there's not some crazy thing to like significantly drop cortisol. Like everyone's like this, this crazy thing, it's over time, just making sure you have practices in your day to day. That's going to help reduce your overall feeling of stress. Absolutely. And it's, yeah, there's one of those things where all of these rules, you don't have to have a checklist where every single day you have to do these things. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a checklist. Some of these days you're going to be great at things like eating more protein. The days where Marianne and I were in LA, I don't think I cracked 100 grams. My goal is usually 180 to 200 grams of protein a day. Oh my God. Yeah, no. I don't think I cracked 100 any day that we were there just because of how crazy things were. My yeah. sleep also sucked. This is more of a thing to be cognizant of. And especially, I think, if you're someone who is struggling with overeating or always falling off a diet or can't stick to it or binging or anything, look at these areas. Because one of these 10 areas is probably what's contributing to a lot of that. So, yeah. so that's what we wanted to make this list to do because that's what's going to get you to your freaking end goal, either to lose the weight or to keep weight off or not gain weight over time. That's everybody fits in that camp. You don't have to want to lose weight, but at least most people don't want to gain a ton of weight over time. <sighs> so that's what we got y'all. We got some fun I'm episodes like, coming up. I look like sleep deprived. I don't know if you've noticed how hard it is Probably for my eyes are. to stay open. <laughs> Probably because we are a little bit. That would make a little more sense. So we're going to take a little nap. We're going to take a little breather. We got some good episodes coming your way next week, along with two brand new training programs. Be on the lookout for that. So if you're over on premium, we'll talk to you guys all this Friday for our weekly AMA, give you all some free supplements like we always do. And everybody else, we'll talk to you next Monday for some sick training knowledge.